A hundred thousand demonstrators at the walls of the Kremlin calling for the resignation of Mikhail Gorbachev. That's how this week started in Moscow. That's how far the pendulum has swung. The bloodshed in the Baltics is over how far the pendulum will swing. The issue is how much democracy is enough. Three states bordering the Baltic Sea, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, want more freedom than Gorbachev has been willing to give them so far. They were annexed by Moscow in the 1940s, unwillingly becoming three of the 15 republics that now make up the Soviet Union. The republic that has the largest number of people and the lion's share of the wealth is Russia. Americans often confuse the name of that republic, Russia, with the name of the country. The country is the Soviet Union, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The relationship between the republics and the central Soviet government is at the core of the current crisis. From the Baltic coast to the Russian plains, there is a demand for more independence. And the man leading that independence movement is the man who leads Russia, 59-year-old Boris Yeltsin. Yeltsin was born a peasant, trained as an engineer, and evolved into a potent politician. A one-time ally of Gorbachev, he fell into disfavor and then fought his way back. He has become Gorbachev's nemesis. Certainly Yeltsin is more popular now than the Soviet president is. He's become the most popular politician in the country. When Gorbachev allowed open elections, Yeltsin beat out a Gorbachev candidate last year to become chairman of the Russian parliament. That's the top job in Russia, the most powerful position in the largest and richest Soviet republic of them all. The building that houses the parliament, the Supreme Soviet of Russia, is called, curiously enough, the White House. We talked there in the ornate chambers assigned to the chairman and began with a central question. Mr. Yeltsin, how would you describe the conditions in your country today? Crisis, uh, catastrophe, uh, on the verge of civil war, what? Crisis, yes. Verge of civil war, yes. It has not yet reached the state of a catastrophe. Are you and Mr. Gorbachev on a collision course? The recent actions, which have been on the increase, indicate that he has been losing his common sense. And this is dangerous. How can it be possible to use troops against civilians at this time? Not only our country will turn away from him, but the whole world will turn away from him. Do you want complete independence for the Baltic states? If they want it, yes. No violence. Not at all. You think that the army is, will be rebelling if President Gorbachev tries to use force? That he does not have the army behind him? I believe that the army will not support him on a global scale. And it is not without reason that some of the troops, airborne troops, have been put in the command of the KGB and taken from the command of the army itself. Mr. Gorbachev has said that if each republic is independent, that it would be the death of the Soviet Union. Uh, what would happen to the Soviet Union per se if each of you have independence? And how far would that independence go? Europe did not disintegrate when the European Parliament came into existence. Every state in Europe is prospering. The same in this situation. Every republic, every state has its own sovereignty, its independent domestic and foreign policy. Yes, the army should be for the whole country. The railroads should be for the whole country. Perhaps communications, too. Perhaps power engineering, coupled with nuclear power engineering. But that's all. And 60-odd ministries are not necessary, not in Russia anyway. Is that not then the end of the Soviet Union as we know it? No, this is going to be a union, but not with the same global vertical center pin that is very rigid. This will be a horizontal union, a horizontal union of sovereign republics with a small center entity. 
Most likely. Would Mr. Gorbachev be the head of this small entity? Uh, well, if he holds his post for the foreseeable future, he will remain the president of the country. You have said that Mr. Gorbachev did everything too timidly and too late. What should he have done? When he started these things, he didn't make a forecast of what he was going to end up with. He relied on intuition and was not consistent. If he was under great pressure from, from the left wing, he did one thing, and then he was under pressure from the right wing, and he did another thing. And this inconsistency has brought about the consequences that we have now. Mr. Yeltsin, in our country, we were quite intrigued by Mrs. Gorbachev. You write of the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Gorbachev like luxury. I was surprised to learn that there are marble mansions for the people high up in the government. Limousines, we knew, private planes, great luxury. And you have said that is one of the problems Mr. Gorbachev has. Well, it is, you understand, a very delicate question. But I think this is in the true American spirit to ask such questions, and therefore I will say yes, I believe so. The luxury still exists in this country for the top people? Yes, of course. But luxury is only for the top people. Perestroika reform has not reached the marketplace. Shortages and long lines are still a part of everyday Soviet life. This line is for bread. The longest line we saw in Moscow was this one, outside a store called Children's World. The word was out that the store had a new shipment of clothing and toys, rare commodities for Soviet children. In this economy, the demand devours the supply. The most compelling questions here deal with the long term. What is the future of this society? Is communism dead? Is democracy possible? And can a people who have lived for generations under conformity change their entire way of life? Look ahead. If you could do what you wanted, would you see this country being a democracy? Yes, of course. Communism, Communism no. Is communism now dead? I have said that on several occasions, when I was in the United States of America, too. I have been saying that for at least three years. Is Perestroika now dead? I believe that it has run its course. The democratic institutions have been crumbling, and the mass media have been hit. I mean, several editorial boards have been shut down. And yesterday, the president went as far as saying that perhaps we should suspend the law on the press. One of the things that's always been said is that your people have had generations now in which there has been no personal initiative. That this cannot be taught. And therefore, a free market system in this country is not something the people want. Yes, entrepreneurs are few and far between in this country, but we have adopted laws on entrepreneurship. Fifty managers will be trained in the United Kingdom, in the United States too, in Japan. People of 30 to 35 years of age, talented people, people with university diplomas, they don't know what business is, what entrepreneurship is, what a market is, but they are prepared to learn in those countries. I want to talk a bit about you, because you are not uh, as well known, of course, as Mr. Gorbachev, but people are beginning to know you. Tell us a bit about yourself. What motivates you? What inspires you? Yes, I understand what you mean. As to whether I'm prominent or not prominent, this is the Western point of view. But as to anybody's prominence in this country, you should look at the rating of our politicians, the rating based on public opinion polls. Now, I think you are blinded to certain things. You see only the personality of Gorbachev and an aura around him. An appropriate euphoria has built up around him. You don't see the developments taking place inside the country. You don't see the process of republics attaining sovereignty. 
You don't see this, and this will be a major mistake by the United States if they don't see this process. Do you see yourself as the successor to Mr. Gorbachev? Is this the position that, uh, that you want? What I want is this. I want him to regain his right senses. I want him to get back on the road of democracy and abandon his attempts to grab absolute power. I want him to admit that the sovereignty of republics is an historical inevitability. This is the best alternative. And I would concentrate on the problems of Russia. If he continues, if Mr. Gorbachev continues to go to the right, if there is that dictatorship that Mr. Shevardnadze warned of, what then? Then the four republics, Russia, the Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, will unite and set up a union. And the presidents of the republics or states will rotate to head the union. There will not be a single dictator. What Yeltsin is really talking about is secession. The four largest republics would break away from the USSR. No more central government. No more Mr. Gorbachev. Do you have a specific message for the United States? To conclude a treaty with Russia. A separate treaty with Russia? Yes, directly with Russia. We do have that right. We have independent foreign policy, and we have the right to conclude such a treaty. I must ask you something that is a rather a sensitive subject. When you were visiting America, there were reports that you drank too much. Uh, the reports were conflicting, but the rumor lingers. Do you drink too much? No. Yes, on holidays. Yes, sometimes when I meet my friends from my college days, but otherwise, no. And I believe that even judging by the way I look, you can see that it's true. Mr. Yeltsin, on a personal level, you write of your, um, the terrible state that you were in when Mr. Gorbachev forced you out of the government in 1987 that you had what amounted to a nervous breakdown. Uh, you have a heart condition. And you say, I quote, every time I am slandered, I am terribly distressed and I suffer. If history or society puts you at the head of this country, can so sensitive a man take that kind of position? Yes, this is one of my weak points, but this is a weak point of a politician and not a human being. Yes, I take everything close to my heart, particularly slander. And it's difficult for me, but I believe no matter how hard it can be, it is what you feel with your heart, with your soul. It's better to be this way rather than a politician without a soul. Well, he's fascinating. Very direct, isn't he, in his no. answers, right? Now, it appears that U.S. policy is to continue to support Gorbachev. Mm -hmm. What do you think the reasoning is behind this? Well, you know the expression, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. Yeah. Not that Gorbachev is a devil, but the most, necessarily, a devil. the most important thing for the president now is to have the Gulf policy supported. If Gorbachev is overthrown by the hardliners, who knows what their policy might be? Yeah. They may decide that they don't want to further support the president. And with Gorbachev, at least he knows what he has. What about a standard? on the summit at this time? Well, the president uh, he hasn't said directly, but it looks as if he's not going. And if he doesn't go, he'll blame it on the Gulf. He won't say it's because of Gorbachev's actions. But the Congress is pressuring him not to go, and it doesn't look as if he will. Very good. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm.